Montreal. I also worked in a number, a number of other cities in Canada as a reporter, as well as for the United Nations. So, Andrew Cadell. Thanks, Wayne. And uh, I'd really appreciate being here. Uh, I know there are a lot of very knowledgeable people, and uh, this is a presentation of my interest. Um, I'm very indebted to Mount Hall uh, and also J.P. Martel because, uh, of course, they're a, a great historian of hockey in, uh, in Quebec, and I rely on a lot of their research as well as my own. So, um, this is a story about my uh, grandfather, a hockey player you never would have heard of. He's a blip in our history. Had he not suffered myopia as a young man, had contact lenses or sport glasses been invented at the time, he might be someone we'd be celebrating today. But they weren't, and we aren't. So many of us who played, like so many of us who played the game and played well, he failed in his quest to play at the top levels of the game. But he remained an ardent fan and an athlete. And although his days as a hockey player were behind him, he continued to embrace the credo of sport, to do your best and leave it all on the ice. And while striving to win, to play fair and accept defeat graciously. His name was Leonard Burton Ramsey, who was my grandfather, and I'm pleased to tell his story, The Skater, today. And this is featured in my book, The Goal. The reason I call him The Skater is that these skates from 1909, and in that photo there, um, he still had, he was very sort of frugal Scott, he kept them polished and kept them in perfect shape and he skated with me when he was 70, when I was five years old in the uh, 19, early, late 1950s. Um, so, Burton uh, was born in uh, Lévis, Quebec, opposite Quebec City, in October of 1889. He was the fifth child and second son of George and Ag Agnes Ramsey. His father was a shipping agent, a winter sports enthusiast, and one of the founders of the YMCA in Quebec City in 1880. Now, as in Lévis, I don't know if you know the geography of Quebec City, but Lévis is the other shore, and at that time, there was no bridge between uh, Quebec and uh, Lévis, but it was, it was uh, further uh, upriver in any, any of it. So, uh, it was in Lévis, opposite Quebec, on the frozen one kilometer span from shore to shore that he learned to skate. His family home on La Côte du Passage was just above the bluffs that descend to the water, and so once the ice came in, it was a short walk down to the riverside and the endless skating rink that beckoned from the shore. In those days, they built an ice bridge uh, between Quebec Levy and Quebec. From the time he was five years old, Burton would walk down the hill and onto the ice, lace on boots with runners on them, and skate along the frozen shore with his older brother, Stuart. He and Stuart would head down to the ice whenever they could, and Stuart would tutor his younger brother on how to skate and play the new game of ice hockey, whose <coughs> rules had only been formulated a few years before in Montreal. In short order, he learned how to place a small piece of wood on the tip of his stick and shoot it towards the frozen lumps of ice at the other end of the rink. In those severe winters, the frozen ice that lay beyond their makeshift rink became a thoroughfare as an ice bridge was built between Levy and Quebec. What was the ferry route from one bank to another from April to December, and still is, became a frozen road on which carriages, wagons, and people moved from South Shore Levy to school, businesses, and shops in Quebec City. Now, sometimes, Stuart and Burton would skate as far as the other side of the river following the ice bridge to Quebec. They were familiar with the ice bridge as it was their daily route to school. However, when the ice broke up, there was no more skating and only huge flows in the river before the ferries returned to the shore in spring. Describing his childhood, he told me, when the ice broke up, wooden planks were placed between the flows, and that's how I walked to school, mm. going from <laughs> flow to flow to the other shore. I asked him if it wasn't dangerous, and he replied, yeah, well, we didn't notice it that much. And then he smiled and he said, but I imagine that's why my, my parents had six children, <laughs> just in case they lost one. Right? He admitted to me that when the flows were too far apart, they'd get a canoe to take them to the other side, and those canoes led to the famous races between canoes uh, on the ice and the flows uh, during Quebec's uh, carnival. Now, the family moved to Quebec City in 1900, uh, when he was 11, to St. Famille Street, which is inside the walls of Quebec, and his father founded a company making bricks from the shale on the shores uh, east of Quebec City. Meanwhile, as he grew older, uh, Burton canoed in the summers and uh, in, the, in the rivers around Quebec, and snowshoe raced 
uh, long distances in the winter against men much older than he was and won many times. He also played it for his high school rugby and hockey teams, and this is the Quebec High School team, 1904, and that's him. Uh, with many fellows who actually ended up playing hockey with him too. He was a he was a strong player and began to dream of a career as a professional hockey player. Some of the players he competed against in junior went on to stardom in the brand new National Hockey Association, which later became the NHL. Brothers Joe Malone and Jeff Malone were two such stars. He also played in uh, uh, pickup games against Patty Moran and with uh, the, the Power Brothers, Rocket and Joe, Chubby and Frank, who were friends of his and with whom uh, he dated their sister for five years. Um, Joe Malone played for the Quebec Hockey Club, the Bulldogs, after junior, and then with the Montreal Canadiens, where, as you know, he scored a phenomenal 44 goals in uh, 22 games in 1917-1918, which is a record that's never been uh, equaled, and uh, my uh, grandfather always said that uh, Joe was a tremendous gentleman, both on and off the ice. His uh, cousin, Jimmy Gillespie, was a star for the Quebec Bulldogs, um, and he was uh, Burton's idol. He was a solid forward who dished out body checks and scored at will. Jimmy played for the Quebec Bulldogs from 1900 to 1910, and for many years was their top scorer. <coughs> Burton would go to the games to watch him play from the time he was about 11 years old, and he would never hesitate to mention him <coughs> whenever the subject of old-time hockey came up. When Jimmy died in the 1960s, his obituary mentioned his hockey career. It said, Jimmy Gillespie was an outstanding athlete in his younger days. He was a member of the Quebec champion Crescents in 1897, and the Quebec Bulldogs of 1904. He played alongside some of the greats of the era, Rocket and Joe Power, Patty Moran, and Herb Jordan. So back to Burton, who's something like a zealot of uh, hockey, I think, um, doing some research in, into his old letters to his mother. Um, I discovered that at 18, he was sent to Shikutami to, um, to play, uh, to perfect his French with uh, his uh, bank, with the Molson's bank and he played hockey with the local men. Writing to his mother, he recounts, I play hockey with the Victorias, a competitive club team, three times a week, and I have had the honor of obtaining a place on the first team. I don't enjoy it as much as playing at home, as they are, for the most part, a pretty rough class. Still, they play very good hockey here, and <clears throat> as the only, it's the only recreation I get here, I'm making the most of it. So in the Shkumi League, there were four teams. What he didn't mention to his mother was that the goaltender for one of those teams, the Kutushkutshmi, was none other than George Vezina. According to the newspapers of the day, Vezina shut the Victorias out twice, and there's no record <clears throat> if that first team forward potted a goal against the future hockey icon. But the games were not without some rough stuff. <clears throat> the local newspaper, Le Progrès, in reporting on a battle between the Shkutshmi Club and the Victorias, suggested the Victorias had a tendency to play more with their sticks than with their skates. I don't know if that was what they were talking about my grandfather or not, but uh, um, he went back to Quebec and played um, a junior, played left wing for St. George's, uh, a junior squad that was supported by the English community in Quebec. The games of the old Quebec hockey rink by the Saint Louis Gate uh, off uh, La Grande Allée were rambunctious affairs. And I asked him if the friction between the English and French communities in Quebec ever showed itself on the ice. Oh no, he said disarmingly. Some of my teammates were French and we all always got along with them. We, we liked their style and we admired them a lot. Then he paused. But the Irish, that was a different story. <laughs> he proceeded to tell me how when the English teams played the Irish, there were fights on the ice and in the stands. And when, when things got really intense, fans in the stands would take the hot, round stove covers and throw them at the players on the ice. Oh, <laughs> There's a, the hot stove league, right? Um, and he said, he paused and he said, now that was a bit dangerous. He moved up to the uh, St. George's Senior Club and was an official with uh, the, that uh, the next year's junior team, and you can see him up to the, uh, to the right, right there, and started dating the sister of, uh, of, of Joe and Rocket and Chubby Power and his best friend Frank. Kathleen was an Irish beauty a few years younger than Burton, and they dated for five years. <clears throat> the senior team uh, didn't do so well. 
And in one game, we're shellacked nine to one by the Crescents. We're playing a center against Burton, who was a professional, Jack Granary. So the, the game ended up being in dispute. He also played against uh, uh, Joe Malone's brother, Jeff. A newspaper report had good things to say about him nonetheless. Bert Ramsey, who filled the center position for St. George, played a remarkably fast and steady game and was always ready to cover up in this manner. And in this manner, he broke up many attacks at their cage. The wingmen were weak, and it was owing to this that the defensemen, Price and Power, were called on to move out at every opportunity in endeavoring to score. It looked as if this opportunity to move to the Bulldogs was all but assured. However, his eyesight began to, to fail, and he was fitted with glasses. When he missed the net by a few inches one night, he heard a woman behind the net say, Il voit pas clair. He doesn't see clearly. And he knew his dream of professional hockey was over. He continued to play in the second league and in industrial league teams. Then, the bank transferred him to Toronto in 1914. Two things happened. One, Burton's mother was a bigoted Irish Protestant wouldn't allow him to marry Kathleen. And so he gave up his pursuit of Kathleen Power after five years. So heartbroken, he took a job with Molson's Bank in Toronto in an apartment in downtown Toronto uh, with so many cockroaches, he gave names to them. He enjoyed going to the ball games uh, on uh, Hanlon's Point on Toronto Island and was there one September day when George Herman Babe Ruth hit his only minor league home run while pitching for the Providence Grace. He returned to Quebec City in 1915 and began dating a schoolmate of his older sisters. Estella Measure was from a prominent Quebec family. Her grandfather had been the mayor of Quebec. Her father was a francophone merchant and her mother had been educated at the Ursuline Convent. They were married in, uh, in uh, 1916 at the Measure summer home in, in Kamaraska, uh, July 1916. Uh, the marriage and a paucity of young men in the bank led to a promotion for Burton to be the manager of Molson's Bank in Cowanville, a small town in the eastern townships. There his first child, my mother, was born. He moved to the bank from the bank to work in a textile firm called uh, Belding Paul in Montreal. At the same time, Estelle was pregnant and gave birth to a son, but afterwards fell ill and was hospitalized in the Verdun insane, insane Asylum for a couple of years. At a uh, point a couple of years later, she looked around and asked what she was doing there and was soon released. As the 20s turned to 30, the 30s, his father called him back to Quebec to run the family brick company, and he was active in the Kiwanis and as an after-dinner speaker, advocating for programs to rebuild the inner city of Quebec as a way to promote economic growth in the Depression. In Quebec, uh, he stayed in shape running an amateur scooter since so no races, and as a member of the Quebec Winter Club, and in the summer, they'd go to the Little Saguenay Fishing Club with his family, including his brother Stuart, who is now a doctor in Montreal, and his sister-in-law, Juliette, and, uh, and his father are pictured here. Um, he also coached and played tennis and coached uh, his young protege, Julien Gigal, all the way to the Canadian Junior Women's Finals. Now, sport was part of his life, and on his wall, he always had a, 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 a framed uh, quote from Grant and Rice. You probably all know it. And when that one great scorer comes to mark against your name, he marks not whether you won or lost, but how you played the game. This came, this credo was tested uh, when he was manager of the brick company as in the depression, there weren't a lot of people building houses and it was tough to, to, to keep the brick company going. And the Université de Montréal in Montreal was just being built and they had a massive contract for bricks and it was down to the Quebec Citadel Brick Company, which my grandfather was, was the general manager of, and uh, another company, <coughs> and uh, the, uh, the rector of the, uh, or the head of the University of Montreal, brought him into his uh, office and said, now Mr. Ramsey, we really like your bid and we'd really like to do business with you. There's uh, just one thing. He said, what's that? Well, we'd like you to make a $10,000 contribution to the university. <coughs> and now $10,000 in those days was a lot of money. The contract, however, was in the millions, which was a lot of money. <laughs> and if you've ever seen the University de Montréal, it's all brick. So he said to him, uh, well, uh, did my competitors give you this, uh, uh, agree to this uh, arrangement? And he said, uh, he said, yes, they did. Well, it's a condition of the, of, the, of the bid. And he said, well, yes, it is. So he said, well, then what you're asking for is a bribe. He said, well, I wouldn't put it that way, Mr. Ramsey. And he said, well, 
That's how I would put it. <laughs> and I thought, I don't do business that way. Mm -hmm. And he walked away from it. He told me that story 50 years later, and he said, I, I have no regrets. Mm -hmm. And the other company that uh, won it, they're one of the richest families in Quebec. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, he was an ex exceptional tennis player. Um, he returned to buildings as general manager, was thrown into the war effort, making parachutes and clothing for the soldiers <coughs> abroad. And after the war, his passion and skill for tennis led him to be invited to play for Canada in the Gordon Cup, the equivalent of the Davis Cup at the senior level, an annual match between Canada and the United States that continues to this day. His partner on the team was a young former diplomat who was uh, then uh, an MP and Minister for External Affairs. At 52, Lester Pearson was eight years younger than Burton, and you can see there's, uh, there's Burton and there's Lester Pearson at oh, the, uh, the Gordon Cup, the inaugural Gordon Cup, which for the sake still goes on. He was promoted to president of Elding Corticelli and served for five years, then became chairman of the board, retiring at 75. He continued to skate into his 70s and had the long, smooth strides of a great hockey player. He was a huge fan of the Kenna Jan, living about a block away from the forum, went to the games very often. He was good friends with David Molson, and uh, one, one day David Molson brought Rocket Richard to lunch, and he came back from lunch uh, like a 10-year-old boy. How on earth did you have lunch with Rocket Richard? He said, David Molson brought him. I said, you know David Molson? He said, yeah, but he brought Rocket Richard. <laughs> so um, they, uh, uh, Stella and Burton celebrated their 50th anniversary in Kamaraska in 1966. He was given a golf cart and a set of uh, golf clubs. He was 76. That morning he played three sets of tennis, and he regularly portaged his canoe down to the water solo and set out in the canoe uh, to, in the river by himself. When I asked him if the golf clubs meant that he was going to take up golf seriously, he told me, no, I'm going to stick with tennis for a while. I'll take up golf when I get old. <laughs> Estelle died in, in the summer of, in the winter of 1975, the next summer on the day that would have been his 60th anniversary. He and I portaged the canoe down to the river and canoed for a couple of hours around the Kamaraska Islands. He was 86. He began to slow down when he was an old folks home in the Notre Dame de Grasse district of Montreal. One day we got a call um, from, from him. He'd gone for a walk from NDG downtown, and he'd gone uh, seven kilometers downtown. He was in front of McGill. Um, so I, I went, I drove to pick him up, and I said, Yo, you can't do this at 89. And uh, at your age, and he said, uh, there's no such word as can't. He died in the spring of 1982 at 92 years old. He was buried in the family plot at Mount Hermon Cemetery, which has a uh, breathtaking view of, uh, the heights of, from the heights of Quebec, of uh, Livy. And as the coffin was lowered into the ground on that sunny March day, I looked across the river to Livy and thought of young Burton skating and playing hockey for hours on that shore with his brother and cheerfully putting his life at risk by walking across the flows to get to school. Now the river was breaking up as spring approached, and the flows were beginning to form. And now, at last, he'd come home. I don't know if there's going to be any questions, but uh, I'm certainly available for them. And I can tell some other yarns about it that are in my book. Well, tell us a bit about the book. Uh, well, the book is a selection of, of stories that relate to, to me and my family. The, it's called The Goal because I was the world's worst goalie when I was 10 years old. And of course, I was the goalie because I couldn't skate. So uh, I uh, played for a team that was pretty good, but it was all individuals who played as individuals instead of a team. And we were losing games by 15 to 2 and 14 to 1 and 10 to 1. And I was the goalie, so I was kind of tired of being scored on. And, of course, as you probably know, outdoor rinks aren't that great for, uh, especially in those days, when you got when you got your brother's skates and your your, your pack newspapers, and then you get chillblains pretty quickly. And uh, playing in 30 below in uh, Montreal, my, my feet would freeze pretty quickly, and uh, it would be mean about five or ten minutes of crying after the game as they uh, as they as they warmed up. So I decided I'd learn how to skate, learn how to shoot. And it happened that there was a guy who scored about 100 goals against me that year. And uh, I practiced when I had carried my equipment about a mile to the, to the rink and practiced every night. And at the end of my practice, after about an hour skating back and forth and shooting, I'd have my own breakaway. So I had the, so, there were so many breakaways that scored against me. So I had my own breakaway. And I practiced it over and over again. And as it happened, my coach let me play in the last game. And uh, 
the other team's goalie was injured, and the guy who scored 100 goals on me was in their net. And so, sure enough, I got my own breakaway and I scored on him, and the, my whole, the entire team jumped, jumped on top of me, and it was, uh, it was quite a thrill. Uh, the other stories were about uh, my dad, who went to the longest, was at the longest ever hockey game in um, in uh, Montreal. Uh, a story written by Dave Stubbs for the Montreal Gazette about the, my, my dad was there at 2:30 in the morning when uh, Mud Brunito scored for Detroit after six overtime periods. And my dad had a great had a great line. He said, "When we went to the game, we thought we were going to a hockey game. We didn't know we'd go to three. <laughs> and uh, there's a story about uh, uh, women's hockey. And a woman who played in our uh, in our community was the best hockey player in in her division, and um, it was a struggle for her to play initially. But uh, uh, she played with the boys. She was the top scorer of the team uh, in the league, and was uh, and they won the championship a couple of years in a row. She went on to be MVP of all her college and university teams. But in those days, there was nowhere else to go. So um, I sort of do a little history of women's hockey and then tie it together, having been at the women's hockey championship last year in Ottawa and said if we had, if, if, if Marge had been born 20 years later, or if we'd recognized women's hockey a little earlier, she would have been out there throwing her gloves up and, and, and her stick and, and, and holding the Clarkson Cup because she was a superb hockey player. So, um, um, and then uh, there's uh, yarns about uh, the outdoor rink, the classic outdoor rink, and one of my friends built her outdoor rink based on, my, on the story. And uh, there's also a story about the uh, rink, the outdoor rink in Kamaraska, the night that Mario Lemieux retired, there was a huge snowstorm, snowstorm and, and uh, all the kids were inside the, the dressing room of the local rink uh, watching Mario Lemieux on TV. And um, my son said, let's go out and play some hockey. And I said, well, there's snow everywhere. And it turned out the snow had just stopped. It was very light. We shoveled a little bit. And all the kids came out and shoveled off the rink. And we had a fantastic <coughs> game for the ages. And uh, and if you've ever played outdoor hockey at night on a crisp, clean rink, it's, uh, it's, it was very memorable. And uh, instead of sitting watching Mario Lemieux, we, we honored hockey by playing outside. So anyway, there's just, there are a few good stories that uh, I think uh, they'll give, give, a good, give you a good smile. And they've gotten very good reviews, which I'm very pleased about. And, uh, and it, uh, it honors both the, the current uh, history and the future of hockey as well as, as the past. But it's all about the people you wouldn't have known and the people who support the game and the kids who play it, much like many of you. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks very much. Oh, thanks very much. Yeah, right. uh, the St. George uh, Club. Yep. Do you have any information about the organization, whether it was local, because there's a St. George's Club uh, also that existed in Toronto and uh, in the late 19th century. So just wondering if it's... <coughs> more of a, a broad institution. I'm not sure. I, I would have thought it was that because the uh, essentially it started out that the clubs were based on ethnicity. So the Joe Malone played for the Irish of St. Patrick's Club. And it might have also been their schools. Because I know that there was a St. George's school in Quebec City that my, my uh, grandfather went to elementary school. So it might have been that. But um, so the St. George's would have been the English club, but then they they had Frank Francophone players. It's what I actually just looking at the names there, um, doing some research in uh, Marc Durand's book, uh, La Coupe à Québec, um, which is a great book if you read French. I mean, he really should publish an English version because it's a superb book. Anyway, uh, there are a number of names that come up that are in that photo, like uh, Woods played for uh, play goal uh, for um, St. George's End as well for the Bulldogs. And um, Frank Power, I don't know if Frank Power ever played with his brothers, but, uh, but he was a pretty skilled athlete as well. So it'd be interesting to do a little bit of research to find out what happened to all those guys. Anyone? Yeah. Thanks so much.